Good morning, everyone. Welcome to those of you who have joined us so far. As we wait a few minutes to give people time to log in, um, just wanted to mention that today's webinar is part of our ongoing Listen and Learn educational series, where every month we focus on a different ear or hearing related topic. Today's talk marks the last talk of our 2021 series. Our goal over the course of this series has been to educate, inform, and answer questions that you may have during this live interactive session with members of our medical and audiology team. If you'd like to watch any of our previous sessions, you can download them from our website by going to www.eardoctor.org events. And the address is also at the bottom of the next slide here. Um, just a few housekeeping items before we begin. During this session, your audio and video will be turned off just so that everyone can easily hear the speaker. We'd also like to encourage you to use the question and answer Q&A button um, or the chat function at the bottom of your screen here in Zoom to submit your questions at any point during the presentation. Our speaker will be happy to answer all of your questions at the end of the presentation. We've also enabled live captioning for this presentation. So if your Zoom account has this feature turned on and you're not seeing a live transcript on your screen, simply click on the live transcript button on your toolbar along the bottom and then select enable auto transcription and you should see the transcription appear on the bottom of your screen. I think that covers the housekeeping items. So let's go ahead and get started. Today we have a very special presentation by Dr. Steven Zuniga who will be discussing all things tinnitus related. Dr. Zuniga is a California native and received his bachelor's degree from the University of San Diego. He received his medical degree from Loyola University in Chicago and he completed his internship and residency in otolaryngology, head and neck surgery at Temple University in Philadelphia. He was subsequently awarded a fellowship in neurotology and lateral skull based surgery at the University of Minnesota, allowing him the opportunity to be double board certified in otolaryngology, head and neck surgery, and neurotology. Dr. Zuniga is involved in multiple research endeavors, including investigations of the human balance system and the development of a novel auditory nerve implant. We now invite you to sit back, listen, and learn while Dr. Zuniga explains more about exactly what tinnitus is and how to best manage it. Without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Zuniga. Chelsea, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, and thank you all for joining us this morning uh, for our webinar uh, where we're going to talk tinnitus this morning. So let's jump right into it. So many of you uh, listening to this webinar may have found yourself in a situation where you settle in for a silent moment of relaxation after a busy day, only you're not met with silence. Rather, you're met with a noise like a ringing, buzzing, hissing, or clicking, though there's no external uh, source of that sound present. This perception of sound without an external source is known as tinnitus, and it currently affects over 50 million Americans um, and actually affects one in 10 adults worldwide. Tinnitus has actually been plaguing society since ancient Babylon, afflicting individuals such as Leonardo da Vinci and Charles Darwin. Humanity has essentially thrown the kitchen sink at tinnitus, trying treatments as varied as exorcisms to inserting reed stock into the external ear. And in fact, Hippocrates suggested masking the inner sound with an outer sound, which interestingly is still a treatment that we recommend to this day. Because tinnitus represents a phenomenon in which sound is perceived despite no sound being present, we often refer to tinnitus as a phantom sensation. In a famous painting illustrated here, uh, known as The Scream, painter Edward Munch illustrates this point um, as the individual attempts to quiet their tinnitus by covering their ears. As we will learn, this unfortunately does not help as tinnitus is a sound generated in the brain rather than in the ear. It's important to remember that tinnitus is a symptom, it's not a disease. And we will discuss multiple different causes of tinnitus, as well as some factors that may make your tinnitus worse. Understanding these causes and the factors that make it worse are all crucial to developing an effective management strategy. So tinnitus may occur in one ear or in both ears. It may be perceived as coming from within the head or actually as an external sound source. While well, for the majority of people, tinnitus is not particularly intrusive, there is a subset of our patients, about 8% of people, where tinnitus is persistent, meaning that they experience it almost every day, and it's been present for more than six months. 
This can have a severe impact on patient's quality of life. This can affect your ability to sleep, your, your ability to understand speech. It can impair your concentration. Uh, it can lead to depression and it can lead to emotional difficulty both at work and at home. To make matters worse, tinnitus is often dismissed by clinicians with patients being told that there's no medication or surgery for your symptom and you must learn to live with it. Well, today we're gonna to discuss what causes tinnitus, how we diagnose this, and what therapeutic options are available for its treatment. So if we take a look a little bit about the normal workings of the ear. So under normal conditions, sound waves enter your ear canal and they vibrate your eardrum. They vibrate three small bones that are attached to your eardrum and that vibrational energy is turned into electrical energy by the organ of hearing, which is the cochlea. These electrical impulses are then sent to the area of the brain that's responsible for interpreting auditory information, the auditory cortex. And so the activity with, of these neurons within the auditory cortex is never zero. There's always a baseline firing rate. Let's crudely say like it's this line up at the top right of your screen here. You can liken this to a car idling. It's never off. There's always a baseline right there, even in silence. So over time, your brain recognizes that this baseline rate is your interpretation of silence. When you hear sound, that neural activity increases and your brain perceives that as sound. Well, what happens if something impacts the strength of those auditory signals that are being sent to the brain? This can be an impairment of sound's ability to get to the cochlea, such as if you have an earwax impaction, an infection of your ear where the ear is swollen shut, or simply have water in the ear after you're getting out of the water after a surf session. There are other things that can impact the sensory cells within the cochlea itself, such as noise trauma to the ear, went to a loud rock concert, or too close to an explosion, like some of our military personnel, or you could work in an occupation where you're consistently exposed to loud sounds, such as a firefighter or construction worker. Well, all of these things impair the strength of the auditory signals that are being sent to the auditory cortex. And your brain interprets that as a decrease in volume. And any of us watching TV, listening to a podcast, if the volume were to suddenly drop, chances are that we would reflexively go to turn the volume back up. Well, your brain does something very similar. It increases its sensitivity to sound because it really wants all of that auditory stimulation in the periphery. And it does this by increasing the neural activity in the auditory circuit. And so this increase in neural activity, let's say you go from this line to this line here, it increases your sensitivity to sound, which is a normal adaptive process and a good thing. However, it has an unintended side effect. This increased neural activity within the auditory cortex is perceived as a sound, and we call that sound tinnitus. Now this type of tinnitus is subjective non pulsatile tinnitus. So this is a persistent sound that does not match your heartbeat that can only be heard by you. Of patients with tinnitus, 90% suffer from this uh, subtype. This is most commonly related to noise induced hearing loss or hearing loss related to aging. But as we'll talk about, there can be many causes of damage to the inner ear with resultant hearing loss and tinnitus. This can affect all frequency ranges, but we most commonly see it due to hearing loss in the higher frequency ranges. And again, this is a sound that's generated by the hyperactivity of the auditory system within the brain and not actually in the ear. Believe it or not, there actually is a subtype of tinnitus that other people can hear. We call that objective tinnitus. It's very, very rare. There's also a subtype that sounds as though it matches your heartbeat. And we call this pulsatile tinnitus. It's typically due to vascular abnormalities in or around the ear. These subtypes are much less common. And so the focus of today's talk is gonna be on this subjective non postal tinnitus subtype. We have more information on these other types on our website. We'd be more than happy to talk to you about these types if this is what you're suffering from at a clinic visit here. So the obstruction in hearing that we just talked about, these are typically reversible. You can come in, we can clean out your earwax, treat that ear infection, and with temporary noise trauma, the sensory cells within the cochlea typically recover. Well, what happens when there's permanent damage to the sensory cells that occurs? Let's say recurrent noise trauma, a fireman who's worked for 30 years and was exposed to the siren all that time, or a construction worker who's consistently around loud sounds. Age-related hearing loss, the sensory cells within our ear are damaged and die off with the normal process of aging. 
there are also certain medications that can be toxic to the inner ear and cause uh, loss of these sensory cells. Specific inner ear disorders also affect the inner ear. Things like otosclerosis or Meniere's disease affect the health of the sensory cells within the cochlea. Head trauma, while affecting the brain, can also affect those sensory cells within the cochlea due to a shearing effect. And so because of this, the strength of those auditory signals never recovers. It stays persistently low. And so that hyperactivity within the auditory cortex, within the brain, stays elevated. Now, over time, your brain recognizes that there's something wrong. And so it remodels itself to adapt to this new set point. This is a process called neuroplasticity, and it's an important process in the development of persistent bothersome tinnitus. To understand neuroplasticity a little bit better, we'll talk about another, uh, well, another example of this. Now, this is a normal process. It's an adaptive process in your brain. All of us actually have a blind spot in our eye. So the red here is the retina. This is where the photoreceptors, the cells that detect light and send it to the brain are located. Now the nerve that carries this information and the blood vessels that support the eye need to enter and exit at some point. We call this the optic disc. No photoreceptors can exist at this point. And so this would seem to be a blind spot in your vision, yet none of us typically detect this blind spot. And to prove to you that this exists, we're gonna find our blind spot here today. We're gonna do this by closing or covering our left eye, and we're gonna stare with our right eye at that black dot on the screen. As you move your head away, and towards the screen, what you'll notice is that that cross on the right-hand side will disappear at one spot. You found the blind spot in your right eye. If you do the same with both eyes open, moving in and out, you'll notice that that cross does not disappear. Your brain has rewired itself without you even knowing it, where it uses information from your left eye to fill in the gap or blind spot from your right eye. It does the same thing with information from your right eye, filling in that gap in the left eye. Combining that information fills in the sensory gap so that we don't even perceive it. So this neuroplasticity process is a normal process, but it can have unintended side effects. Let's relate this to the process of hearing. So here is another illustration of the cochlea. And what this is representing is the fact that different parts of the cochlea respond to different sound frequencies. So higher frequencies are represented down here at the base and all the way up here at the tip is where the lower frequencies are represented. This frequency organization is maintained as this information is sent to the brain. And so the auditory cortex here on the right, you can see also is frequency mapped. These equally sized circles here represent this frequency mapping of the brain. And all of these frequencies are about evenly represented. So let's pick on our firefighters today and say that 30 years time you've been exposed to that siren. We know that noise induced hearing loss affects the 4,000 Hertz range disproportionately. And so sensory information from this area is now not being transmitted to the brain effectively. And so the brain perceives this as a gap rather than a blind spot, think of it as a deaf spot. And the brain, like people in California, does not like wasted real estate. And so it wants to remodel itself and so that it's not wasting any of this space. And so what happens, is the areas adjacent to that 4,000 Hertz spot get bigger as the 4,000 Hertz area shrinks uh, in size. And again, this is a normal adaptive process that avoids any sensory gaps in our perception. However, as an unintended side effect, you may see where I'm going with this, this results in the perception of sound. And this is one of the theories that underlies the development of persistent bothersome tinnitus. Now, at this point, you may be saying to yourself, well, not everyone with hearing loss has tinnitus, and you just said that some people's tinnitus is worse than others, and so why is that? Well, that turns out your brain's pretty darn clever, and it understands that there is certain sensory information that may not be particularly pertinent, and so it pushes that information to the background. Whether that is tuning out your spouse, asking you to take the trash out, or just tuning out a fan in the background. Your brain can understand what sensory information may or may not be important and push it to the background. Right now, for example, you're likely not necessarily able to feel the clothes on your body or the shoes on your feet. Now that I've brought it up, you probably are. But typically, this information isn't at the forefront of your mind. It's pushed to the back of your mind. We call this process habituation. And this allows your brain to realize that there is a sensory perception that is not important and it can push it to the background of your thought. 
Now, we also know that the auditory cortex has intimate uh, ties with the emotional area of your brain, known as the limbic system. And tinnitus, for some individuals, can trigger a very strong stress response. The tinnitus triggers a st stress response. The stress response makes your tinnitus worse, and you can see how you can get in a negative feedback loop. And this impairs your ability of your brain to habituate to the tinnitus, making it worse. Further, we know that there are non-auditory factors that can make your tinnitus worse. Smoking, drinking, the use of illicit drugs, even caffeine can increase the hyperexcitability in your brain and make it more difficult for your brain to habituate to this tinnitus. Now, something that goes along uh, with tinnitus, uh, not uncommonly, is something known as hyperacusis. And for those of you with tinnitus out there, you may be experiencing this. Hyperacusis is defined as noise intolerance or uh, annoyance caused by ordinary sounds and abnormal discomfort or even pain with exposure to very loud sounds. And so this can actually be present in people with normal hearing. It's thought to be present in about six to 8% of people uh, with normal hearing. The incidence is much, much higher in people with uh, tinnitus. And we think it is due to this reorganization of this brain, these abnormal processing of auditory information. The prevalence in people with tinnitus varies widely, as you can see here, between 18 to 80 percent. This has to do a lot with what some of these studies define as hyperacusis. Um, but again, this is not uh, an uncommon co-occurrence with tinnitus. While hyperacusis typically does not impact the severity of your tinnitus, it can have a significant impact on your quality of life. This ranges from avoidance of loud social settings, such as concerts and restaurants, to specific frequency sound aversion, such as vacuum cleaners or clinking dishes, things like that. Hyperacusis may also progress to the point where people don't want to go out, social withdrawal. They want to wear earplugs or even earmuffs for extended periods of time, and people can end up becoming housebound to, in order to limit their exposure uh, to acoustic stimuli. Hyperacusis in and of itself can be an entirely other topic, so we're not going to cover it in, ex in extreme detail today. We have more information available on our website, and I would be more than happy to chat with you uh, more about this during a clinic visit. But what we will cover are a couple um, treatment options for hyperacusis that also are effective in treating tinnitus, including auditory amplification with hearing aids, as well as something called tinnitus retraining therapy. And we'll talk about that here in just a sec. So this is the meat, the meat of everything that's going on here, right? The search for an effective medication that will eliminate tinnitus has a long history. Humans have attempted to cure tinnitus with drops, ointments, pills, elixirs, and an assortment of other therapies. And despite what you may see on TV or on the internet, unfortunately, there is no cure for tinnitus. For those of you asking yourselves why you just wasted the past 15 minutes listening to me yammer on, hold tight, there are a few effective uh, treatments for tinnitus uh, that we're going to go over today. And as simple as it may sound, you've already taken the first step in managing your tinnitus simply by attending this webinar. Understanding where tinnitus comes from and what makes it worse, as well as the management strategies that are available for it, is an effective treatment strategy. Um, many patients seek help for their tinnitus only to be told that nothing can be done. And hopefully what you take away from this is that nothing could be further from the truth. I know this is a busy slide, but what I have listed here are uh, a variety of support organizations, um, organizations that are dedicated to the education, management, and research into tinnitus. And if you haven't checked any of these out, I would encourage you to do so. It will provide you um, really important educational materials, give you a little bit more information about management options that are available, but also just connect you with a community of people that have tinnitus you'll quickly realize that you're, you or the people that you know with tinnitus are not alone and that there's a community of support out there um, that is striving to achieve uh, a cure for this disorder. So we just spent a bunch of time talking about how the decreased strength of these auditory signals results in hyperactivity of the brain and the perception of sound that we call tinnitus. So would it make sense to just give the brain back all that sound that it's missing to help with tinnitus? Well, it turns out, yes, that's a pretty effective treatment strategy. In those patients for whom hearing loss is identified, amplification of your hearing, typically with hearing aids, is an extremely beneficial option. People report improvement in the severity of their tinnitus um, up to 85% of the time. And so it's very uh, effective in this regard. Additionally, 
it helps your tinnitus, but it also helps your hearing loss. We know now that hearing loss, um, depending on the severity, can lead to increased rates of the development of dementia. And so the treatment of the hearing loss is actually extremely important as well. In patients treated with hearing aids, with both hearing loss and tinnitus, their quality of life has uh, been shown to significantly improve after being appropriately fit. So we'll talk briefly here about cochlear implantation. So um, cochlear implantation for appropriate candidates can be very useful in the mitigation of tinnitus symptoms. Um, just to review cochlear implantation briefly here, this is a surgically implanted device. An electrode is actually inserted directly into the cochlea, as you can see here. And so rather than the cochlea being the one that's generating those neural signals, that is replaced by the electrode. The electrode is now sending those electrical impulses to the brain. Theoretically, you can improve the strength of those signals being sent to the brain, and they can also be more organized. So rather than weak, unorganized signals being sent to the brain, you have a stronger, more synchronized signal that's being sent there. And so up to 93% of patients who, um, are uh, implanted with a cochlear implant report uh, suppression of their tinnitus two months after activation. And so the natural question is, well, why, why don't we just implant everybody with cochlear implants? And the reason is that insertion of that electrode into the uh, cochlea in about 70% of patients causes you to lose any residual hearing that you have left. And Typically, people with tinnitus still have a pretty good amount of useful hearing left. This is a, a bit of a nuanced area. Um, there's active research going into it. And for uh, appropriate candidates, this can be a useful option. Um, we'll kind of leave it there for today. But if again, if anybody is, uh, is curious or has more questions, we'd be happy to address those uh, as they come up. So while auditory amplification seeks to improve uh, the hearing loss that is driving your tinnitus, Sound therapy seeks to facilitate the process of habituation to your tinnitus, like we, that we talked about earlier. The first way it accomplishes this is through distraction. So people typically say that their tinnitus is most severe in quiet environments when there is no other sound to distract them from their tinnitus, like right before you're about to get ready to go to bed. Sound therapy thus seeks to occupy the neural components in the brain that are driving the tinnitus with other sounds in order to distract away from the tinnitus. The other way that sound therapy is beneficial is in facilitating stress relief. When tinnitus becomes severe, it triggers again, a powerful and progressive stress response that can get you into a negative feedback loop. In contrast, people typically associate sounds such as waterfall, raindrops, birds chirping with a more soothing and calming environment. So the goal of sound therapy is to facilitate habituation and reduce the distress and negative emotional associations of tinnitus. There are several sound delivery um, mechanisms that are available now. You can actually get a physical device from a drugstore or even off Amazon that you can put at your bedside. Nowadays with smartphone and the technology that goes along with that, there are a lot of really good apps that can provide you with, um, with white noise, but as um, at a variety of soundscapes, which may be more appealing and more effective. And so this is actually a very effective treatment strategy. Tinnitus retraining therapy. And so we'll talk a little bit about this. TRT, as we call it, relies on a two-phase approach. And the goal of this is also to facilitate habituation and to control any negative emotional reaction to tinnitus and to hyperacusis. TRT combines sound therapy with counseling to blunt the unpleasant association that can develop uh, to tinnitus. And so this typically involves uh, tailoring sound or music therapy to a person's particular hearing loss and noise is embedded into this sound signal so that over time and with counseling, your brain becomes habituated to this embedded noise. That's the first phase. In a second phase, this noise is slowly removed to the point where you don't notice it, which again facilitates the process of habituation and a disconnect between the emotional uh, triggers that may be associated with tinnitus. There are several devices that are available in this regard. Here at Show at Ear Associates, we have utilized the Neuromonics uh, device. We were actually the first practice in Orange County to offer this device therapy. Our audiologists here and the rest of the staff are very knowledgeable in this technology and would happy to, uh, to discuss this further in a consultation for you. 
So there are no FDA approved medications for tinnitus, despite an extensive body of research into the subject. A wide variety of medications have been trialed uh, to alleviate tinnitus. These include antidepressants, medications used to treat seizure disorders known as anticonvulsants, and anxiety medications such as Valium and Xanax. Um, again, all of these have been extensively studied and none of them have been shown uh, to have any clinically meaningful benefit for tinnitus. The idea is that one of the common themes for these medications is a, a depression in the activity of the brain. And so because tinnitus is thought to be related to hyperactivity in the brain, the natural next step would be, well, why wouldn't these work? And unfortunately, these medications do not work effectively in the areas of the brain that seem to drive tinnitus. And so they do not have a clini clinical meaning, clinically meaningful effect. Additionally, some of these can have uh, side effects, uh, one of which actually includes tinnitus. And so that further limits their use. With regard to over-the-counter remedies, there are currently over 40 over-the-counter tinnitus remedies that are available for purchase. And these are available from reputable retailers, places like Whole Foods and Amazon. Um, the primary herbal remedy uh, for tinnitus is ginkgo biloba, often listed as the single active ingredient in many of these formulations. Other plant derivatives, including black cohosh and uh, rosemary are included. There are several minerals, including zinc, magnesium, selenium, copper, and calcium that make up the primary components of these over-the-counter remedies. There are also several vitamin mixtures, uh, which are typically marketed as lipoflavonoids or bioflavonoids, which consist of a mixture of vitamins that are actually derived from lemons. Um, the most common hormonal supplement in these products is melatonin. And all of these substances, all of these compounds have been tested and none of them have shown, again, a clinically meaningful effect uh, to the improvement of tinnitus. Ginkgo biloba has been particularly extensively um, investigated, again, with no clear recommendation. The, this product contains molecules known as flavonoids and terpenoids. And these, the importance of this is that they can interfere with the, or they can um, increase the blood thinning effect of blood thinning medications such as Coumadin. And so while the side effects from these medications are typically quite mild, they can have serious consequences uh, such as bleeding and even death when um, uh, they're combined with anti, anti or blood thinning medications and things like that. So using caution is, is important. If you search on Google or Amazon, the top search result typically is this lipoflavonoid product here. And if you note the packaging here, it says that this is the number one ENT doctor recommended medication for tinnitus, which is very interesting given that our own American Academy of Otolaryngology actually does not recommend utilization of lipoflavonoid for the treatment of tinnitus. So the takeaway message is here. You can see all these products. If any one of them worked particularly well, that's probably the product that we would recommend. The fact that there's so many speaks to the fact that none of them works particularly well. That's not to say that you'll have zero effect from it, but the studies that have been performed so far have not shown a significant clinical benefit. A lot of them can actually be quite expensive. And while the side effects are typically mild, there can be serious side effects with them. So use caution when considering these products and looking to see if any of these may benefit you. Cognitive behavioral therapy is a well-established form of psychotherapy. Again, this is built on identification and modification of uh, thoughts that trigger stress response and negative emotional um, uh, associations with tinnitus. This was originally designed to treat anxiety and depression. Uh, it teaches skills to identify and change negative thoughts associated with persistent bothersome tinnitus. Um, and, and so it, it will do things. This do, goes through with uh, the mediation of a, of a counselor who's specifically trained for cognitive behavioral therapy. So the negative thought, you know, my tinnitus will ruin everything at the event. I won't be able to hear anyone and I'm going to have a terrible time. Leads to social withdrawal and the feelings of sadness that accompany that. And what CBT trains patients to do is to recognize that negative thought and to replace it with an alternative one. So my tinnitus may limit my ability to hear, but I can enjoy the food and celebrate with my friends, which may lead more to behavior of social engagement and feelings of inclusion and enjoyment. And so data suggests that 
Um, irrespective of the severity of your tinnitus, quality of life is improved after cognitive behavioral therapy. And so this is a very useful tool for people with uh, persistent bothersome tinnitus. Acupuncture is something most of you are likely familiar with and involves the insertion of needles into the body surface and manipulation through um, manual or electric means at certain what they call acu points. Um, and the, the idea behind this is that you're utilizing the peripheral nervous system to modulate the central nervous system. And so acupuncture may modulate some of the centers of the brain, including the limbic system, which is the emotional part of the brain, that are thought to uh, play a role in the development of learned uncomfortable associations with tinnitus. There's conflicting evidence for the usefulness of acupuncture, um, though some people actually have uh, um, reported improvement in their tinnitus symptoms with this therapy. Along similar lines, this is still more of an investigative treatment, but when we get into the world of neuromodulation, vagus nerve stimulation, this is how vagus nerve stimulation has been used for a variety of different medical conditions. And the theory is similar to acupuncture. You're stimulating a part of the peripheral nervous system in an attempt to modulate the central nervous system. And so the idea here is that within our peripheral nervous system, there are two components. There is the sympathetic system, which is our flight, fight or flight response, and the parasympathetic nervous system, which we, we refer to as the rest and digest system. So it's kind of the chill system. The vagus nerve is thought to be one of the primary components of the uh, parasympathetic nervous system. So this rest and digest component. So by activating the vagus nerve, the goal is to restore balance between the parasympathetic drive and the sympathetic drive with the idea ultimately being able to modulate centers of the brain that are involved in the production of tinnitus as well, in, as, well as in the generation of those negative uh, emotional connections. This is still an area of research. Data is still emerging, but early studies have shown some, um, some efficacy with regard to treatment of tinnitus. So we're in California. Cannabis is legal and it has been investigated for a variety of other medical conditions. And likewise, it has been investigated for its utility in tinnitus. So cannabinoids, uh, one of the areas that they're useful for is in the treatment of seizure disorders, epilepsy, uh, due to an inhibitory effect uh, in the brain. And so again, because of this hyperactivity theory, this was applied to the treatment of tinnitus as well. Now, unfortunately, while uh, cannabinoids do have an inhibitory effect on the brain, they also have an excitatory effect on the brain. And in this circumstance, the excitatory effect outweighs the inhibitory effect. So cannabinoids actually can make your tinnitus worse, not better. So unfortunately, at this time, we cannot recommend the use of cannabinoids for your tinnitus. And of course, we can't escape any conversation nowadays without throwing COVID-19 into the mix. So this, the kind of the spoiler alert from this slide is that we kind of don't know. And so we do know that there is some type of physiologic impact of the COVID-19 virus on the inner ear. Researchers at Johns Hopkins actually looked into the inner ear of individuals who had died of COVID-19 and tried to isolate the virus. And they were able to isolate the virus in about 60% of those subjects. So we know that the virus can access the ear and it may influence hearing loss and potentially tinnitus. We also know that people's tinnitus has gotten worse during the pandemic. So that brings me to my next point. We also know that stress and anxiety drives tinnitus. And my goodness, I'm sure all of us have had quite a bit of that during this time of the pandemic. This has been an extremely difficult time for a lot of people. There's increased social isolation. This can lead to increased psychiatric distress. Um, if people need help, if they need to get to the clinician, that can be a lot more difficult. And there's heightened uncertainty a lot about a lot of different things. And so it's difficult for us to say whether or not this uh, worsening of tinnitus is primarily driven by the virus or is more driven by the impact of the pandemic more as a whole. It's likely that there's contributions from both, but data is still emerging in this regard um, and we'll certainly keep you updated as, as things come through. So in conclusion, tinnitus is a phantom sensation that's generated in the brain due to these hyperactive neural pathways, uh, typically due to hearing loss. It has an association with the emotional center of the brain, the limbic system. It can generate a very severe stress response and that can perseverate the tinnitus and make it difficult to habituate to. 
There are multiple treatment strategies available for this. These range from auditory rehabilitation all the way to cognitive behavioral therapy. These aim to improve or give the brain back the hearing loss, the hearing that it has lost, as well as to facilitate the process of habituating to this tinnitus. So thank you all very much for listening to me yammer on for all that time. I'm gonna open the floor up. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free. I'm happy to answer uh, anything that comes up here. Sec, we're gonna look here. So I'm just going to read some of these questions out here. Um, how about diazide caps, water pills for treatment of tinnitus? That's a really good question. Um, so diazide is a, a diuretic or a water pill, and it decreases the amount of, uh, of water that's in your body, it tries to maintain the fluid balance. This is a, an effective treatment strategy in our patients with uh, Meniere's disease, of which tinnitus is a very prominent um, symptom. And the goal here is to, Meniere's disease is thought to be driven by fluid imbalance within the inner ear. And this drives damage to the auditory or the hearing cells within the cochlea and can result in tinnitus. Outside of patients with a diagnosis of Meniere's disease, diazide has not been shown to be an effective management strategy uh, for, for just, I guess, if you want to call it freestanding tinnitus without the diagnosis of Meniere's disease. But within Meniere's disease, it can be an effective treatment strategy. So it's a really good question. Does your office perform vagus nerve uh, stimulation? So at this particular office, we do not offer that service, but uh, I do have patients who have accessed these services within the Orange County and the LA area. So if you, if you do Google it, there are a lot of resources in the area um, that do offer vagus nerve stimulation. If you guys would like some specific recommendations, reach out to us. We'll post uh, a few centers on our website so that you can reference that to look more into this uh, if this is a treatment strategy that you're interested in. So another question, can you speak to any correlation or causation of the COVID-19 vaccine and tinnitus? Very good question. Um, yes, so again, we have um, anecdotally, we have observed a higher rate of tinnitus following COVID-19 uh, vaccination in some patients. Now, is that a correlative finding or a causative finding? That's very difficult uh, to say. And so the thought now, and there's data that is emerging, hopefully actually within the next few months, studies out of uh, the University of California, Irvine will be coming out that look at these. So tinnitus is actually a described side effect of a variety of different uh, vaccines, influenza vaccine, a variety of different things. And the thought is that it is due to a reactivation of pathways that are actually involved in migraine. And so this is not unique to the COVID-19 vaccine. This has been described for a variety of other vaccines. And currently when, because uh, I do, and we do see patients who uh, report that their tinnitus either developed or worsened after the COVID-19 vaccine, we talk about treatment, uh, preventative treatment for migraines, actually. I know that sounds uh, a little bit silly, uh, even uh, given the fact that these patients may or may not have a headache, but we do know that this, uh, this seems to be an effective treatment strategy. So yes, uh, we have seen a, a correlation between the two. No, it is not unique to the COVID-19 vaccine, and there are treatment strategies uh, that we recommend and have shown to be uh, useful. If you only feel beating in the ear with no sound associated, is that tinnitus? Yes, so this is that uh, pulsatile tinnitus variant. There can be a lot of different causes, causes for this pulsatile tinnitus uh, variant. These range anywhere from earwax, ear infection, to vascular abnormalities um, in and around the ear. And so if this, is a, if this is a variant of tinnitus that you have, um, coming in for an evaluation would, would be a really good idea. We would do a hearing test for you to see if there's any hearing component, as well as obviously take a look in the ear and see if there's anything there. There's a variety of, um, of clinical characteristics as well as physical exam findings that can help us to differentiate uh, what is causing this pulsatile tinnitus. Has there been any info regarding diet or certain foods that affect level of tinnitus? Yes, very good question. So again, kind of going back to uh, the migraine topic is with the COVID-19 vaccine. So there does seem to be 
some correlation between the pathways, the neural pathways that influence people with migraines and those pathways and how they influence tinnitus. And so one of the treatment strategies that we um, discuss is actually going on a migraine diet. Some of those foods uh, within migraines, such as aged cheeses, uh, red wine, things like that, actually sometimes can trigger people's tinnitus. And again, uh, we don't fully understand the pathophysiology or the cause behind this, but we think it has to do with migraine. And so um, going on a migraine diet, of which we have information uh, on our website, can potentially uh, impact uh, the severity of your tinnitus. It's a very good question. Is it uncommon for the wine sound to be augmented when I put in my Oticon earpiece? This happens occasionally. Very good question. So yes, there is a variant of tinnitus called somatic tinnitus. And again, it goes back to the idea of um, stimulation of the peripheral nervous system. So some people describe a phenomenon where if they push in front of their ear, or behind their ear, or on their jaw, their tinnitus actually changes in pitch, gets worse, or even gets better. And so we call this somatic tinnitus. Um, and we think it is because of a connection between the sensory nerves uh, for your face and the ear and the vagus nerve. And so um, this is actually one of the bases of the development of neuromodulatory technology, including vagus nerve stimulation that may benefit uh, tinnitus. So for people uh, with this somatic tinnitus subtype, these vagus nerve stimulators can potentially be effective as well as uh, acupuncture. Acupuncture tends to be more effective in people with somatic tinnitus. So why would tinnitus be at its worst after sleeping? So that's a good question. It, it's not that way for, for everyone. Some people, uh, it is it, it varies a little bit with um, the environment that you're waking up into. If it's a silent environment, you're kind of coming out of a deep sleep or something like that, your tinnitus can be quite apparent just because uh, you've been in, in, again, a quiet environment for so long. Once you're exposed to sound and kind of get on with your day, um, this can be, uh, this can improve. Also, if you're a coffee drinker, and this is before you've had your, your coffee, um, the tinnitus can be there because of kind of withdrawal like symptoms, I believe. And the unfortunate thing is uh, coffee actually can make it worse. So right there. Can you discuss a bit more of the vascular abnormalities uh, in the air? Absolutely. And so this goes into that pulsatile tinnitus uh, subtype. There are a, a variety of abnormalities here. Um, there's quite a list, um, just a few of them. There can be benign uh, vascular tumors in and around the ear. Uh, these are called paragangliomas. Uh, in the ear, it's either a glomus tympanicum or a glomus jugulari, if anybody's familiar with these. Uh, there's also a large, uh, what we call sinus, that drains the blood from your head that runs around from the back of your ear down and actually connects with your jugular vein uh, down here. And so if you notice that when you compress the side of your body on your base of your neck with that pulse cell tinnitus and it gets better, that's a good indication that it's vascular in subtype. And so there can be small outpouchings of that sinus. Um, typically that sinus is covered with bone and it can be slightly um, uncovered. We call that dehiscent, which can cause turbulent blood flow in the area and result in this pulsatile tinnitus subtype. Um, we also know that this can be due to increased pressure uh, in the head. And so if you're having uh, persistent headaches, changes in your vision, um, things like that, this also can be due to an increase in pressure uh, within in the head. So I have both tinnitus and hyperacusis. Do they both come together? Yes, very good question. Um, so yes, uh, again, kind of referencing back to that slide, the, the incidence of hyperacusis, again, which is an abnormal um, sensitivity or it's a hypersensitivity to sound, um, it, it is present in, a, well, they say 18 to 80%, which I know isn't a very helpful range, but uh, it's not necessarily uncommon to have this with tinnitus. And the two go hand in hand. Again, it's the brain is rewiring to adapt uh, to this hearing loss or some type of insult to the auditory system. And so um, it can kind of overcorrect in a way. And so the perception of seemingly benign sounds can be very, very loud. And so, yes, the two typically do go hand in hand. Treatment of tinnitus in a lot of cases actually improves the severity of people's hyperacusis as well. And so they, they, they go hand in hand symptomatically. 
uh, which is kind of good because if the treatment for one works, typically it, it, it affects the other as well. So isn't an environmental factor the increasing noise volumes in restaurants? Yes, very good question. Um, and so, I mean, many of you with an Apple Watch uh, that's new may even know that there's a decibel meter on your Apple Watch. And so, yeah, we live in an extremely noisy world. Um, restaurants, bars, even the use of headsets. Now, a lot of kids who are doing remote learning, adults who are working from home are using headsets um, and the volume on those can actually be louder than you, than you think. And so, yes, our increased noisy world is putting it so that your perceived baseline uh, of hearing is elevated. And so that when you finally do get a chance to escape all that and get to a silent environment, you're hearing that hyper excitability as it kind of tries to, to calm itself down. I've heard this condition can escalate dementia. Is this true? Um, very good question. Uh, typically, tinnitus uh, in and of itself. Again, it's uh, tinnitus is a, a symptom rather than a disease. And so um, tinnitus typically goes along with hearing loss and hearing loss absolutely can make uh, dementia or can increase the risk of dementia. Um, we had this thought years ago. Now we have concrete scientific data to show that people with hearing loss are about two to five times more likely to develop dementia when you compare that to normal hearing individuals or individuals with hearing loss who have had their hearing appropriately um, rehabilitated. So they're wearing hearing aids that are appropriately fit. So it's typically not the tinnitus of itself that's driving the dementia. It's whatever is underlying uh, the tinnitus and driving the tinnitus that can be causing the, the increased risk of dementia. So how is Meniere's disease diagnosed? Very good question. So Meniere's disease uh, is a clinical diagnosis. Um, it's based on a variety of different symptoms. Uh, we do a hearing test, uh, a decrease in your hearing in a very specific pattern and area can be very characteristic of Meniere's disease. Classically, people with Meniere's disease suffer very debilitating attacks of, of vertigo. They feel like the room is spinning, uh, which typically lasts for hours. Associated with, this, with these attacks is a very, very loud version of tinnitus a decrease in their hearing and a fullness or a pressure sensation uh, in the ear. If this happens recurrently and we identify a particular type of hearing loss on your hearing test, this is very diagnostic of Meniere's disease. Unfortunately, it's not always that clear cut, but we do have uh, concrete diagnostic guidelines uh, that include what I just referenced uh, for the diagnosis of Meniere's disease. So I've been recently diagnosed with no help in sight. Do I need another evaluation from your office or can I just bring my recent evaluations? That's a great question. And, and you know, I just want to reach out. Whoever asked that question, you're, you're not alone. This, is, this happens not infrequently. Um, tinnitus is, is a little bit misunderstood in a lot of different ways. And people don't always realize that there actually is a good amount of help that is available out there. Um, we would be happy to do another evaluation here. Uh, typically, we that involves getting a hearing test at our facility just because our audiologists are pretty well versed in doing this. We do this all day, every day um, in our offices. Fortunately, my audiologist uh, and the audiologist part of the team, uh, they sit right across the hall from me, which is fantastic. So I can go right across the hall and discuss a case of them, ask them if they can do a hearing test, discuss anything. So we're we're readily set up for all of uh, all of that. They're a wonderful group. I love working with them. It's fantastic, um, and so it's worth um, getting another getting another evaluation and kind of discussing the the surrounding of, um, circumstances that are causing your tinnitus. So, will tinnitus interfere or give false hearing test results? Yes, great question. So, typically, the way that we perform our audiograms, our hearing tests, um, we typically get an accurate result despite tinnitus. Now, um, tinnitus can interfere with your hearing um, kind of day-to-day -day basis. It can be, make it very difficult uh, uh, to comprehend speech or just to hear things because it is so loud in the ear. Um, that's a very good question, but the way that we do the, uh, the audiogram, typically we're able to get a, an accurate result on our hearing test here, but yes, day-to-day, -day, it can, it can in, impact your hearing pretty severely. 
So if you have a loss of ability to understand words on TV, but hear noise and have tinnitus, is there any help for increasing clarity of words? Uh, yes. So that is, that's a great question. Um, so the tinnitus in itself, and again, going back to this idea that tinnitus is, it's a symptom rather than a disease. And so the tinnitus can impact your perceived clarity. And so your clarity can be maintained, but the tinnitus is distorting it just from the sound. Now, there are other disorders that affect the inner ear or even the hearing nerve that impact uh, your ability to hear sound, but also the clarity of your sound. And as a byproduct of that, you get tinnitus. So in that case, it's worth getting a hearing test again. We're able to get a pretty accurate hearing test despite the presence of tinnitus that gives us, um, it gives us a level of your ability to hear. So just the level that you're able to hear at, but we also have a specific test where we test the clarity of speech that's coming in. And based on the results of that, we can recommend different things to, to evaluate um, one or the other further. If there's hearing loss and a clarity issue, both, neither, whatever it may be, that kind of points us in, in different uh, directions diagnostically. Does what you said apply to phantom musical ear? It's a great question. Um, so in a way, so this has to do a little bit with um, hyperacusis, what we refer to as uh, misophonia, which is um, a, a variant of hyperacusis. It's an extreme irritability to sound. And um, in what we call auditory um, uh, phantom perceptions. And so this is actually a separate uh, diagnostic uh, area. It's a very good question. They do, they exist on a spectrum, uh, but some people with this actually describe, and th this may be the case, that they hear a specific sound, like the Star Spangled Banner or an orchestra or something like that. So it's not just a sound that they hear, it's actually a specific song or music or something like that. And um, these are abnormal auditory uh, perceptions. They can be present with or without hearing loss, Again, they fall along the same lines, but it's a little bit different. And the treatment uh, is a little bit more targeted to this particular subtype. We actually um, send patients to a very, very good audiologist who uh, specializes in this. Um, and so, and she does a very, very good job with our patients. So if you are experiencing um, something like this, uh, we do have some good resources available for, for treatment. So why, uh, or some days my tinnitus is louder than others and my hearing is not declined because of my tinnitus. So great question, yeah. You will experience this typically. This is not uncommon for people with tinnitus. You'll have good days and you'll have bad days. And this is due to a variety of different factors. Uh, some instances people feel like their uh, tinnitus all of a sudden becomes, um, they, they all of a sudden become aware of it because of a particularly stressful event in their life, whether they have, a project or a deadline to meet, or they're trying to get a big Thanksgiving dinner ready for the family. Stressors can induce it. Um, Non-auditory things can induce it. Caffeine, smoking, those types of things. Um, your day-to-day, -day, your level of hydration, hunger, all these different things affect our brain chemistry. It's, it's a very complex mix of things. And so it's important to, if you're able to identify what things make your tinnitus worse? Like, oh my goodness, I was so tired. Like I didn't get any sleep. My tinnitus was terrible, but then I got a great night's sleep and, and it, it got way better. So things like that, there's a variety of, of different examples like that, but not uncommonly people can identify certain triggers for their tinnitus, just like you can identify triggers for your migraine. Um, and it's very multifactorial. It's different for everyone. And there's a lot of different things that can, that can play into it. So that's a really good question. Oh, so does a Baja device give any relief for tinnitus? Traditional hearing aids do not work for me. I have single-sided deafness and the tinnitus started right away after the loss. Great question. So yes, in um, referencing back to when we chatted about cochlear implantation. So one of the initial areas of research for the effectiveness of cochlear implants were for people with single-sided deafness. 
Um, some individuals can experience a sudden hearing loss on one side where they wake up one morning and their hearing is completely gone. We call this sudden sensory neural hearing loss. And there are some things that we can do to try to bring the hearing back. But for those people uh, who do not recover a significant amount of hearing, they can be left with really, really severe uh, tinnitus on that side. Baja devices or bone anchored hearing aids are a type of device. And what that device does is it doesn't provide any, uh, any restorative hearing to the ear that is deaf. It simply takes the sound from the other uh, part of the, or from the side that's deaf, and it transports it to the good hearing ear by vibrating the, the, the bone of the skull. And so your, the bone of your skull is actually really good at transducing sound. And so you're actually not restoring any hearing to that deafened ear. You're just transmitting the sound to your good ear. So you're hearing everything in your good ear. And so uh, in patients with single-sided deafness and really bad um, tinnitus, cochlear implantation may be an option. You may not get uh, a really significant improvement in your hearing, you may, but again, going back to that, it can improve the strength of the auditory signal that's going to the brain and it can synchronize it more. And so um, again, it's a bit of a nuanced area. There are specific candidacy criteria for that, but um, if that's the situation you're in, it's, it's something that may be worth looking into. Well, intermittent tinnitus continue to get worse over the years. Depends a little bit. I wish I had a straighter answer to that, but yes, um, I myself have intermittent tinnitus. Every now and again, I'll be lying down and all of a sudden there it will be. Um, it depends on what's driving your tinnitus a little bit. If it is hearing loss, um, hearing loss uh, in many cases does tend to get worse over time. And so that will uh, potentially cause your tinnitus to get worse with it. Um, it also depends a little bit on how well your brain naturally habituates uh, to that tinnitus. And so it's a little bit hard to predict. Um, I know that's not a great answer. It can stay the same, it can get better, it can get uh, worse. Uh, it depends a little bit on what's driving the tinnitus and kind of how bothersome it is and how often you're getting it and things like that. I had a local ENT doctor tell me every senior will have tinnitus and I was shocked at that generalization. Yeah, I think um, that may be a, a little bit of, of an overstatement. Um, not uh, So age-related hearing loss is not necessarily an uncommon thing. Like the rest of our body, our ears also tend to decline a little bit with age. And so, um, yes, we do see quite a bit of age-related hearing loss. Now, again, not everybody with hearing loss has tinnitus. Again, it, it, it depends on how well your brain habituates to it and a variety of other factors. Um, simply... Being old does not mean that you're going to get tinnitus. No, there has to be some some driver. Again, it's a symptom of something of something else. Uh, so yeah, I I would I would agree with you that 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 was a generalization, and perhaps uh, not entirely incorrect. But I I think the motives were very good. But it may may have been a, a little too broad. Yes, I have tinnitus and find earplugs in high noise settings to be very helpful. Is this a good approach? So um, yeah, if this works for you, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, um, people with hyperacusis, sometimes they utilize this therapy to, to help them. Um, the noisy environments can make it hard. Again, there, there's a processing issue that goes along with your tinnitus. There's something in the brain that has remodeled or that's adjusting to this new uh, noise perception that you have. And so in really, really noisy environments, there can be a component of hyperacusis that's going on that can actually make your, your tinnitus worse or can make you perceive sound as more bothersome. So if earplugs are working for you, that's actually not a bad strategy to kind of minimize the amount of acoustic stimuli that, that you're getting with the ears. Can you discuss tinnitus caused by shingles? Yes, and so there is, um, there is a variant of shingles that occurs in the head and the neck region. Um, we call it herpes zoster oticus. And so it is when uh, you can actually get shingles of the face that involves the ear. Sometimes this virus can affect uh, the facial movement nerve, your balance nerves, as well as your hearing nerve. And we call this variant Ramsey-Hunt syndrome. And so it is, um, 
many of you may be familiar with Bell's palsy. It's a, a, a paralysis or a palsy of one side of your face. We think it's caused by a reactivation in an, of a virus that lives in the facial movement nerve and causes inflammation. Something similar happens uh, with Ramsey Hunt syndrome or shingles of the face and the ear. Uh, this inflammation from the virus causes inflammation of the hearing nerve and can cause um, a hearing loss. This uh, may be temporary, but it can be permanent. And so if you find yourself in this situation, um, a hearing test, an ear exam, and appropriate treatment is necessary. And uh, typically that treatment involves um, steroids to decrease that inflammation, as well as antivirals to treat the shingles and things like that. So I believe I have postal tinnitus. How can I find out more about treatments for this type of tinnitus? So again, um, it will be, it'll be based on kind of what is driving that tinnitus. So an initial hearing test and evaluation to kind of um, evaluate any factors that may be driving it is an important first step. And based on um, the underlying diagnosis, if one is found, that will guide uh, treatment strategies and, and things like that. But an initial evaluation is a good first step to kind of figure out what's going on there. So any thoughts on if I should just continue to stick with a hearing aid or if I should do surgery? So yeah, um, so there are, no, there are no surgeries that specifically address tinnitus. Cochlear implantation is a surgical procedure and yes, it is a treatment of tinnitus, but um, that is, it's a very specific and kind of nuanced situation. And so um, if your hearing aids are not affording you the benefit that you, um, that you want from your tinnitus, at that point, we, we typically, before we jump to something like cochlear implantation or something like that, we talk about other treatment strategies that are a little bit um, more involved. Things like tinnitus retraining therapy, excuse me, or cognitive behavioral therapy, even things like that to really uh, address the perception of the tinnitus. A really good first step also, if you haven't had a hearing uh, test recently is to get an updated hearing test and to make sure that your hearing aids are tuned properly. You'd be surprised uh, at how often you go out, people go out and they pay thousands of dollars for this nice set of hearing aids, uh, but they're not either getting the hearing benefit that they want or the relief of tinnitus that they rely on. And one of the first things that we do is to make sure that the hearing aids are working properly. They're an expensive device. They're a really device, nice device. Let's make sure that they're tuned properly to your specific hearing loss and they're functioning appropriately before we take that next step. So it's a good first uh, place to start. So is there any correlation between tinnitus and vertigo? Yes, great question. So again, depends a bit on the, um, the underlying cause of the, of the tinnitus. And so there are certain conditions that can produce both tinnitus and vertigo. A good example is Meniere's disease, where there is some insult to the inner ear. Now the, the inner ear houses both the hearing organs as well as the balance organs. So an insult to the hearing uh, organ can actually result in an insult to the balance organ as well. And so there are certain um, causes of tinnitus that can be associated with some type of dizziness like vertigo. Um, again, things like Meniere's disease, there's something else called vestibular neuritis that can actually result in this. Um, and so if this is uh, persistent, it's definitely something that's worth, uh, worth getting checked out because there are some uh, various diagnoses that are associated with both. So my hearing aids seem to help tinnitus fairly well, but not hyperacusis. What is the best way to address this? Great question. So again, first thing to do is to make sure that the hearing aids are tuned properly. Um, the, they can be a bit too loud. Um, and so that could be driving that hyperacusis. The sounds are just, the, the stimulus is too strong for the ear. And so making sure that the hearing aids are tuned is a really good first step. Uh, beyond that, considering things like tinnitus retraining therapy, as well as cognitive behavioral therapy are two very good strategies beyond the hearing aids uh, to address the hyperacusis. Um, again, we, uh, we know people in the area who um, are specialists in these areas, and so that's typically who we refer our patients to uh, because they're very familiar with this disorder and they have very effective treatment strategies uh, to try in this regard. So that's a great question.
So I have tinnitus in one ear only, and I have otosclerosis in both. I've adjusted my hearing aids and have not been wearing them consistently over the last few months. It really hasn't improved since. Also, this started about two months after getting COVID. So um, yes, good question. Complex situation. So otosclerosis uh, can drive tinnitus a couple of different ways. So for those of you that may not be familiar with otosclerosis, it's an abnormal uh, bony remodeling of the bone that surrounds the ear. And one of the ear bones that transmits that vibrational energy to the cochlea essentially gets uh, stuck in place because of this abnormal bony remodeling. And so that can cause a certain type of hearing loss. Now, over time, again, this is a bony remodeling of the cochlea. So in addition to that bone being stuck, it can actually affect the sensory cells inside of the cochlea itself. And so hearing aids can, can kind of only go so far if the otosclerosis has progressed to that point where it's affecting the cochlea itself, because that results in a, in a neural type of hearing loss, then hearing aids don't always um, amplify uh, super well, depending on the, on the severity. And so um, it's worth, again, getting an updated hearing test if you haven't recently, getting the hearing aids tuned a little bit and kind of seeing where your otosclerosis is um, and optimizing the benefit that you may be getting from the, the hearing aids. Um, COVID, again, it's hard, to, it's hard to say whether that's causative or correlative, um, just from what I kind of mentioned earlier. We, we know that the virus, again, can access the inner ear, but the extent of the effect that it can have is still uh, a matter of investigation. And you have the, the surrounding kind of confounding circumstances of the pandemic itself. So um, it's a little bit hard to say definitively at, at this point. Can chemotherapy affect it? Absolutely. Yes. So um, if we refer back to so some of those ototoxic medications that I referred to, certain types of chemotherapy are toxic to the ear. And so for certain uh, regimens, um, if this rings a bell for anybody, such as cisplatin uh, or some other types of chemotherapy regimens, um, this can actually be toxic to the ear and the, the toxicity to the ear can result in damage to the sensory cells and results um, in tinnitus. And so in some cases, when people are receiving an ototoxic chemotherapeutic agent, uh, we monitor their hearing in a specific way um, over the course of their treatment to see if there's any dip in their, in their hearing. We kind of, we monitor the health of the inner ear using something called otoacoustic emissions. And so um, if that's something that your oncologist is concerned about, it's definitely certain something that we can we can assist with in that regard but yeah that's a great question so does wearing ear pods etc make tinnitus uh worse so um that would be more related to uh if there's any hearing loss as a result of wearing those um the the physical act of occluding the ear actually uh, can make tinnitus worse. So if any of you out there have uh, noise canceling headphones or something like that, and you turn on the noise activation, sometimes your tinnitus will be worse because all of a sudden it's a super silent um, environment. Once you play your music, that typically goes away and everything is fine. Um, but that can be one of the factors uh, that is there. And then um, again, going back to a question that we had earlier with us being in a noisier environment, yes, the use of um, of ear pods and hearing or headphones and things like that uh, has been shown to potentially um, lead to, to damage to the, to the inner ear. And so it's something to be, to be wary of uh, moving forward, definitely. So can tinnitus be related to temporal mandibular joint disorder? Absolutely. Um, again, temporal mandibular joint disorder, for those of you that may be unfamiliar with that, is essentially an arthritis of the jaw joint where you can get popping and clicking in the, in the jaw joint and because the back of the jaw joint is the front of the ear, people often say that they um, have ear pain or ear fullness or pressure uh, with TMJ. And uh, it can definitely modulate tinnitus. Again, referring back to um, the sensory uh, nerves that provide sensation to the face, those actually do run through the jaw joint. And so arthritis and inflammation of the jaw can lead um, to tinnitus. And some people say with uh, temporomandibular joint disease that they have 
that somatic tinnitus subtype, where if they push on their jaw joint or they push behind their ear, their tinnitus changes. And so um, that is one of the factors that we look for. And that can be an indication that your tinnitus is being driven um, by, uh, by TMJ or temporal mandibular joint disorder. So Bose, Amazon have devices that fit in your ear when you sleep and provide a variety of ambient noises that are supposed to help offset the tinnitus. What experience do you, uh, your patients have with them and do they work? You know, that's a really good question and I do not have a good answer for it. But I know that our audiologists probably would. They deal a lot more with the device side of things. Um, and so I don't wanna give you incorrect information. I am not sure, but if you reach out to us, there is definitely somebody here that can answer that question better than I can. Um, and again, it'll be our audiologists. They're extremely well-versed in all of the different hearing devices uh, that are available and uh, as well as how people are doing. Cause they, when you develop a relationship with uh, our audiologist, you're gonna be seeing them not infrequently. And so they're, they're very attuned to how well you're doing uh, with whatever auditory device uh, you're utilizing. And so um, I will pass that on to them. Uh, if you wanna reach out to us, I can, I can reach out to you with a, with a better answer to that question. So do over-the-counter allergy medications, for example, Claritin make tinnitus worse? Um, so the medication itself, so Claritin is an antihistamine um, utilized, like you said, for, for allergies. Antihistamines in and of themselves, there's has not been an, an overwhelming side effect of antihistamines is not necessarily tinnitus. Um, so the medication itself has not been shown to make tinnitus extremely uh, worse. Now, if you look at the list of side effects for a lot of these medications, they will list different, uh, different things. Tinnitus may be included in that. It doesn't mean that it's a major side effect, but it's something that somebody had at some point taking the medication. And so short answer is uh, I have not heard that consistently that antihistamines um, uh, make tinnitus worse, but it is not impossible. So which form of tinnitus can be diagnosed via imaging or lab test? Um, so good question, a little bit of a, not a complicated re response, but it's not super straightforward. So both the pulsatile and the non-pulsatile subtypes of tinnitus can be diagnosed uh, with imaging. Um, lab tests can play a role in some types of pulsatile tinnitus, but not necessarily in the diagnosis of, of the cause. So again, going back to the theme, I know I've brought it up a million times, that tinnitus is a symptom, not a disease. And so we really need to figure out what is driving it. Uncommonly, um, there can be a benign growth on the one of two uh, balance nerves. And this benign growth can push on the hearing nerve. And that can, uh, that can drive tinnitus and hearing loss. And that is diagnosed with an MRI. So that's, there has to be a very specific um, set of symptoms as well as findings on the audiogram for us to be alerted to the possibility of that. And so that's one circumstance. Repulsital tinnitus, um, if there's not a readily observable um, cause for it based on your hearing test, uh, us chatting uh, for a history and then the physical examination when we look in your ear, then yes, one of the options is that we do obtain um, some imaging of the ear, whether that's a CT scan or an MRI. And so some of these different vascular causes of pulsatile tinnitus can be diagnosed uh, based on imaging. And in some of those circumstances, we do get lab tests, but it's not so much for diagnosis, it's more for characterization of the, of the tumor that we, that we found. So can your office recommend a great physical therapist that works with individuals who have uh, somatic tinnitus? So yes, we have a variety of uh, physical therapists uh, that are available to you. We also have um, temporal mandibular joint specialists that are available. These are dentists who have uh, dedicated their practice to temporal mandibular joint disorder. It is quite prevalent and it can be uh, severely affect people. And so um, we, we do have the option to, to consult with them um, to, to utilize their referral network as well for uh, physical therapists um, that utilize this. There are actually uh, temporal mandibular joint clinics um, that, are, that are designed for this. And, and one of the things, again, with TMJ is somatic tinnitus. And so there are people that are familiar with the treatment of that and could potentially assist. So yeah, we can, uh, we can try to get some resources uh, for you in that regard. 
So my tinnitus started after surfer's ear surgery. Drills were used rather than chisel tools only. Will conditions diminish over time? It's been one year post-surgery so far and no decrease. So very good question. So for, again, for those of you not familiar with it, surfer's ear is uh, the growth uh, of uh, benign bony lesions in the ear canal, which can actually close up your ear canal. It's thought to be due to chronic cold water exposure. Surfers fit that category. And it's been called uh, surface ear. We call them exostoses. And so, yes, we do uh, quite a few of those types of surgeries here. We do not utilize the drill technique. We utilize the um, micro chisel uh, technique. Uh, one of the a rare side effects uh, when using the drill is that the drills that we use um, spin at about 70,000 RPM. So they're high speed drills. They're very effective. But when that you can imagine how much vibrational energy that creates, especially when you're doing it right in the ear. And so that vibrational energy can be damaging to the inner ear and cause a particular type of hearing loss. And again, tinnitus symptom rather than a disease. And so if you, uh, if you do get a uh, high frequency hearing loss as a result of that, that can, that can cause tinnitus that may be persistent because that damage can be permanent. And so um, again, hearing aids and potentially some of these other ambient noise um, therapies can be useful in the, in the treatment of that. It's hard to say without getting a, again, first step would be getting a hearing test to, to diagnose a hearing loss if it is there and kind of that helps us characterize what be, what might be driving the tinnitus, but that's, that's one possibility um, following uh, surfer's ear surgery or, or exostoses excision. All right, Dr. Zaniga, I'm going to have to cut you short. Okay, we there we go. had such a great question and answer session, everyone. Um, I do, uh, because we still have a few questions that Dr. Zaniga was not able to answer. Um, we want to give you the opportunity to email us those questions. We would love to take care of any concern you might have or any question that came up. Um, feel free if you are still listening and uh, your question was not answered to email us at news, that's N-E-W-S at eardoctor.org, and we'll be happy to point you in the right direction. Um, we're so thankful to those of you who joined us today um, uh, for our last webinar of 2021. If you'd like to listen again or share with somebody you know, keep an eye on your email inbox. We'll be sending out a recording of today's presentation, which includes the question and answer session in the next few days, or even better, you can stay connected by subscribing to our new YouTube channel. Um, just look us up at Shohet Ear Associates Medical on YouTube. Um, we look forward to connecting with you again in the new year when we'll be continuing this webinar series with new topics, new speakers, you won't wanna miss it. Um, we're wishing you joy and wellness over the holidays and throughout the new year. And uh, from all of us to you, thank you for joining us today and we hope to talk to you soon. Thank you everyone, appreciate it.